Okay, hi guys. Um, my name's Trevor Bond. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a kind of zoo geomorphologist and a zoo geomorphologist. And my PhD research is looking at the effects of cattle grazing in chalk rivers. So just a basic kind of presentation overview, uh, fairly simple stuff. To begin with, there'll be an introduction explaining what chalk rivers are, what cattle are, and how they interact. Then there'll be uh, the presentation of a theoretical model that kind of links all of the interactions conceptually. Then we'll go on quite simply to what I've done in my PhD, what I did, to put it in kind of Cockney, South East London slang. Uh, then there'll be some results. This is the main section of the PhD. There'll be about six slides on this, and there'll be lots of little studies which I'll bring together and give you the, the conclusions from. We'll discuss very briefly some current work and my timetable for completion of the PhD, and then finally a summary of both the presentation and the PhD. So, introduction, what is a chalk river? Well, this is a chalk river, um, and a chalk river isn't defined by any river that contains a cow. It's actually defined by two key characteristics, which is chalk geology, so that's bedrock that was laying down around 65 to 100 million years ago, and also a base flow index of greater than 75%. So for those of you that don't know what the base flow index is, we're talking about the percentage of discharge that originates from ground water. Okay, so water underneath the river, if you like, that comes from aquifers and streams. Uh, sorry, and uh, springs. And so there are other things here that help kind of define what is uh, a chalk stream, um, and they're all very important, but it's those top two that really give you the kind of definition. Everything else that you can see in this list is very important in terms of ecology and helping to define chalk rivers, but the technical definition is those top two characteristics. So that's what a chalk stream is, but why are they important? Well, they're important ecologically. There are 10 chalk river sites of specific scientific interest in England, and the chalk rivers in England go all the way from the Hull in Humberside down to uh, the Froome and the Piddle in Dorset. It's the whole kind of east, southeast England. You're going to find chalk streams, and they're important ecologi ecologically. There's also the economic importance. The sports fishing industry is worth around £300 million a year in England, and your salmon, and your trout, and other kind of sports fish you're going to find in chalk streams. And culturally, they're a massive part of our landscape heritage, thinking about water meadows, water mills, um, the development, really, of the English lowland landscape over the last couple of millennia. So what about cattle? Why are they important? Well, beef and milk production, um, pretty obvious. The amount of beef produced in the UK in 2008 was worth £2 billion. Pounds. So that doesn't even take into consideration the value of leather and milk produced by cattle, so they're important economically. And for conservation management, there are numerous studies that have shown that cattle can be used to maintain ecological diversity. So where does the problem stem from when these two collide? Well, there are concerns over cattle impact. I mentioned all the reasons why chalk rivers are important. If a cow then goes into that chalk river, some of those factors, ecological, economical uh, and cultural, could be affected. And there's disagreement between different stakeholders as to the effects of cattle grazing in chalk streams. And that disagreement stems from a lack of scientific knowledge. So onto the zany theoretical model. This will develop over time, and it's a bit laborious. I don't want you to take everything in, OK? But you're going to see on your left-hand side, as you're looking, three main factors, the three main effects of cattle grazing. They're herbivory, which is when a cow eats something. There's animal transit, which is the mechanical process, um, kind of call it causing soil disruption, soil displacement, that kind of thing. And then there's excretion, which is defecation and urination. It's so the key thing to take from this diagram. There's lots of things going on, obviously. But some of the effects are in the terrestrial environment, some are in the aquatic environment. You've got short-term effects and you've got long-term effects. You've got increases in some variables, you've got decreases in some variables. There are both abiotic factors and there are biotic factors. So it's quite a complex kind of system. And to tease it out, the things that we're interested in, um, this is kind of secondary, but these are the kind of ecological variables, your kind of biotic factors. And then more importantly, these are the geomorphological factors, or more specifically, the channel morphology factors. Okay? And they're of, of greatest concern to geomorphologists. 
So that's the zany, the zany diagram, the theoretical model. So what I did um, initially, uh, to begin with this project, there was an observational study of cattle river interactions. Then we did a GPS study of cattle distribution, so mapping cattle in a chalk river environment in space. Then a number of geomorphological studies, which included terrestrial laser scanning of river banks, looking at bank morphology. We had measurements of soil compaction and shear stress to see how much force cattle were exerting when they moved through the environment. In-stream turbidity measurements to see if there was any fine sediment suspension when cattle got into rivers. And then there was also chemical analysis of cattle faeces, which is technically um, not to do with geomorphology exactly, but it all kind of links in. And then the last kind of stage of the PhD in this structure is modelling and back of the envelope calculations, including kind of fine risk modelling, uh, fine sediment risk modelling rather, which I'll, I'll come to at the end. So the results, this is going to go on for a bit, but um, this one you've all heard about, right? The paper in Livestock Science, that um, really important journal. Um, myself, uh, my supervisor, David, who isn't here, um, and uh, Mary Edwards as well had this published. Pretty big stuff, obviously, to get your first paper published. Um, took me forever, so I'm quite glad about that. But the observational study, simple methodology, just sit in a field, watch cows for 500 hours over 65 days from April until October 2010. Every minute, every minute for 500 hours, you record the location and the behaviour of cattle. So whether they're defecating or grazing, or whether they're doing it in the river, you know, or under a tree. Key findings were that cattle spent 2% of their time in the river, they spent 7% of their time in the riparian zone, and we're defining the riparian zone um, as within 5 metres of the water's edge, and also that cattle preferentially defecate in streams, so they poo more when they're in the river. Biggest finding was that as air temperature rose, cattle spent more time in stream. Okay, so it sounds quite intuitive, but it's a very important relation to, to identify. Implications of this study, um, first study of its type, nobody's really looked at this, and potential links to future climate change. Obviously, if cattle behaviour is related to air temperature and the amount of time they spend in rivers is related to air temperature, then future changes in, in air temperature due to climate change are important to consider. GPS study, fairly simple. GPS cattle collars, every 20 seconds they record the location of a, of a cow. Um, we did this last year um, for quite a long period of time, and the key findings were that cattle in this study spent 0.9% of their time in stream and 2.5% of their time in the riparian zone. So the discrepancy there is down to, between this and the observational study, is down to a difference in the amount of time the cattle were observed for. GPS data was 24 hour, the observational study, which I did just by watching cattle, was for eight hours during the middle of the day. So when you take all that out, these two figures do kind of match up and they do marry up the GPS study and the observational study kind of agree. Cattle have areas of preferential usage, which you can see on this map. It doesn't really matter about the great detail of it, but the red areas are the areas that cattle use most, and the green areas are the ones they use the least. This is 24 days' worth of data um, with, as I mentioned, fixes every 20 seconds. So you can see um, where the river is, the big blue line. Uh, there are some kind of crossing points, uh, particularly to the south of the image. So these are the kind of things that we're, we're interested in. And that's not going to go away, which is unfortunate. Um, the implication was that cattle do have areas where they preferentially go, um, and that's important in terms of management and also uh, assessing their impact. Um, and by using this, we can use this kind of map as an input into some kind of model to assess the effects of cattle grazing. Terrestrial laser scanning. A terrestrial laser scanner is like a really cool laser, basically, and it shoots lasers um, at uh, the, the riverbanks, is what we were doing. Um, and you can basically generate digital elevation models from different times, and then you can compare those two digital elevation models to see if there's been any change in the bank elevation. So the key findings, um, perhaps understandably, some of the ramps lost kind of material, there was a net loss in bank material, but also some of the ramps gained material. So um, <laughs> there's defecation, so cattle can put large kind of bits of cow pat um, which get caught within the laser scanner. Um, and yeah, the key thing we found, irrespective of loss or gain, is there was heterogeneity in the cow ramp elevation. So 
The river is the, the blue kind of channel, if you like, and the red areas are showing you areas where there's been kind of erosion, and then you've got green areas where there's been accumulation, kind of. Um, but what we found, and I need to deal with this really, there are variations in bank morphology, and they are complex, but it's difficult to take out the vegetation effects because some of these banks have got vegetation on them, and the laser scanner picks that up as well. And there are lots of things that Jules and Neil uh, and Joe rather have done to get rid of that vegetation effect, but that's, that's something that I need to do. Further research is, is therefore required. So keys of strength meter study. It's getting a little bit geomorphological here, but it's really important. The keys of strength meter, um, we cow trails, they're these things where cows go preferentially, I showed you on the map, those red areas, they generate geomorphological features or create geomorphological features called cow trails. So we compared how much force was required between cow trails and non-cow trails to see whether cattle were having a, a geomorphic effect upon the soil in those different areas. Something like this, you've got a ramp, uh, your cow ramp, you've got your river, and you've got the cow trails in brown. We took samples from in the cow trails and from outside the cow trails, and we compared the erodibility. So the shear stress required to erode a cattle trail was about seven to eight times less than the shear stress required to erode a non-cattle trail. But the other thing we found, which is really interesting, is that if a cow just kind of stands there just static, um, it exerts a pressure of around 250 kilopascals, which is more than the pressure required to induce shear stress on non-cattle trails. So we're kind of showing that cattle are actually capable of generating cow trails pretty much anywhere in the landscape, even where cow trails don't already exist. So that's that. Cattle exert enough force to form cow trails proving in a way that cattle have the capacity at least to act as geomorphic agents and that cow trails are relatively erodible. Then there's the turbidity study. I, th I might just skip past this. It's not overly important. This graph is, I guess, what we're looking at here is uh, we've, got, we've got turbidity um, on the axes and you can see an instance of the cattle being in stream, which is shown by the red bar. Okay, so when the cattle are in stream, we get an increase in in-stream turbidity, and in-stream turbidity is a proxy for fine sediment, effectively, or suspended sediment, more specifically. And so what we're seeing from this graph is that cattle can enter the river, cause disruption, and then cause an increase in in-stream suspended sediment. Implication is that uh, they, they can do this, but we didn't find that many correlations. That graph I showed was the only real incident, uh, and we watched for months and months and months. So, yeah, further research is required with that. Fecal analysis, we looked at nitrogen, we looked at phosphate, we looked at potassium, um, all of these things. And we also found that cattle faeces is mostly water, which is important in terms of the mobilisation of that faeces, potentially getting into into rivers. Cattle feces essentially contain significant nutrients. And then the current work, um, we're trying to put all this stuff together, bring it together in some kind of model, which is hopefully going to map fine sediment risk and trying to assess how all of those things I talked about can come together. We've also done some back of the envelope calculations looking at nutrient loading and discharge, which I hope to develop a bit more. And then this is the big stuff, first draft by the end of July. Uh, June rather, and then submission before the end of July, finishing the PhD. Yep. Um, so just to summarise, cattle rivers and chalk, sorry, chalk rivers and cattle are very important. Theoretical models link cattle river interactions, as I've, I've demonstrated with my conceptual model. We now have got a good handle on how can cattle interact with chalk streams. We understand the effects of cattle geomorphologically. Modelling the back of the envelope calculations is really the next step. It's time to bring it all together and make it kind of significant and big. And then, yeah, hopefully the PhD will be finished soon. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Thanks for keeping us time. We've got time for questions then. Hey. Sure, you said um, the model or the links with it. A biotic and a biotic, and you talked obviously about all the geomorphological stuff. 
Have you done any work or is there any sort of background material on the, the biotic stuff? So where you get more cattle, do you see greater algal content, differences in plants, more plants? Yeah. Can you kind of expand on that? That kind of stuff has been pretty well covered, not necessarily in chalk streams. There are only two uh, studies that are pertinent to that by Summers et al. 2008 and Summers et al. 2005. Um, and they found that basically there was a loss of biodiversity um, and an increase in the abundance of, or the occurrence of algal blooms and that kind of thing. But there's no quantification of the, uh, the forcing. We don't know how many cattle caused that. Um, we don't know what the time scale was, and we don't know what the other factors that aren't caused by cattle are. We felt with the PhD, it was difficult to measure those biotic factors in a short period of time. So that's why we focus predominantly on the, the abiotic kind of geomorphological factors. Yeah. Sure. Yep. I'm just wondering how wide the river in that area is in comparison to, say, the GPS error that you're getting? Yeah, so that's one of the big issues with this. Um, you know, the GPS colour people say that you're going to get a resolution of two to five metres, um, but in practice, you know, it, it might be nearer 10. So um, that GPS data only shows basically instances where we've got a resolution uh, that's better than 10 meters effectively if that makes sense um, the river uh, this particular site is 12 meters wide at the crossing point so yeah there's <laughs> it's it's an issue um, but eliminating that is quite difficult differential GPS would have been ideal but costs time etc uh, yeah, uh, you say the banks were increasing yeah. It seemed quite a small increase. Could that just be a change in vegetation rather than... Yep. You mentioned cow pads. I'm wondering whether it's yeah. vegetation growth or something else rather than the, the cows themselves. 100%. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not... Yeah, sorry if I made it give the impression I thought all of this was cow <laughs> poo. Um, it certainly isn't. Removing the vegetation effects is a real issue um, and there are ways around it. But what I will say is that... Um, some of the laser scans are better than others. I'm more certain there are more errors or less errors. And of the ones, like for example, the 0.8 metres cubed in two months, that loss of bank material, I think that's really representative. I think there were two really good scans and that shows what's actually going on. But it's also undeniable that there is heterogeneity in, in the elevation of the cow ramp and it changes over time um, due to the presence of cattle. So that's the kind of message I want, to, want you to take home really. Yeah, I mean, it's not comparable to Australasia or the big rangelands of, of North America. I'd, I'd certainly say that much. But there are 10 million cattle in the UK. Global cattle populations are expected to double within the next 50 years. And I think that, um, I mean, that in itself is, is something that makes you think, you know, in the future, this is something we need to be concerned about. But people are worried, particularly in counties like Hampshire and Dorset. Um, it's mostly fish, fishermen and uh, the concern is the Environment Agency or the Hampshire Wildlife Trust, they want to introduce cattle because it's good ecologically in terms of ecological diver uh, diversity, in terms of the, um, the uh, disturbance hypothesis, intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So cattle cause a disturbance and that's not a bad thing ecologically. But the fisheries managers say, well, they kill salmon effectively because of organic inputs, reduces the oxygen in the river, means that salmon can't spawn. So they're the two main corners, but nobody's done any proper research into it. And that's the issue kind of in England, I guess. Okay. Just make it a quick one if you can. Okay, I was just wondering 
wondering whether these were, you're looking at dairy cattle or beef as a patterns of dairy cattle going out in and out every day and family herds of beef cattle grazing around pretty scarily at times. Yeah, their behaviour is very different as well. Um, obviously, dairy cattle drink a lot more than beef cattle do. So, um, for all of my studies, I, choo I chose male bullocks, which are the most populous of all of the cattle in the UK. And I chose Holstein bullocks, like the one we see in this image, because they're the most abundant, particularly in the southwest and south. Re south. Did I say bullocks? Did I say bullocks? Say yeah, bullocks. Sorry. <laughs> bullocks. Bullocks. Uh, this, yeah, sorry. A, a good, yeah. <laughs> Holstein's like this, Bullock's <laughs> not like this. So, yeah, but that is obviously a factor in influencing behaviour, certainly. Okay. Thank, thanks very much, Trevor.